Hello, this is Sharon Fisher and Teledyne Yesco would like to thank you for joining us for our webinar, Prep HPLC Simplified. If you have any questions during the webinar, please utilize the Q&A functions within Zoom. All questions will be answered at the end. This webinar will be recorded and a video will be made available in the near future. Today, we are lucky to be joined by Todd Anderson, Teledyne ISCO's Global Chromatography Specialist. With that, I would like to welcome Todd. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I hope you can find something valuable out of the presentation we're giving today. Uh, like Sharon said, this will be recorded and you will have the availability to come back to it later. So there may be some slides that I'll leave uh, up for a little bit and maybe not talk about them as much, but they'll be there for your reference for future if you want to come back and use the data that's there uh, for your own reference. So as, as Sharon mentioned, um, Todd Anderson. I'm the Global Chromatography Specialist. So if you uh, are involved with mass specs or the AccuPrep systems, I will typically be the person that you'll be working with and interfacing with for technical support issues in the field. So I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation. Um, the first slide we have here is going to be HPLC Simplified. So this will be our uh, sort of a plan of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and I'm just going to start right into the uh, method development. Then we'll have some column and mobile phase considerations for you, uh, some sample loading techniques, and some ways to expedite your purifications. And then we'll finalize with some uh, troubleshooting and some things that might wind up going wrong uh, during your typical runs. So some of the shortcut tools that we provide you as hardware options are going to be different uh, types of solvent selectors. So if you see right here, you'll see that we have a big solvent selector right there, and that's in the back of the instrument. We can do three solvents in there, and we'll go in a little, little bit later. We have an auto injector, an auto sampler, and we have some column switching over here on the right hand side. So I'll start with the column selector valve. The nice thing about the column selector valve is we can choose up to four columns and we can isolate each of those individual columns so that you do not get any carryover from one column to the other, which allows us to do different things such as multiple solvent compositions for different columns. If you wanna do high pH, low pH, we can isolate the columns and configure them within the software of the instrument so that you don't have to worry about damaging the columns. The other thing we can also do with this is we can actually put a bypass line in here so that you can always use it as a bypass flush that you can uh, flush out the system. Um, the other thing that it does is it does help us to actually extend the life of your columns because we can take care of them and prevent them from drying out. It's completely independent of the auto sampler or injector. So if you wanna do manual injection, you can still add this to your system. So here's the solvent selector. As you can see, we can change the system from having one A and one B solvent line to having three different solvents. So you can have a mix and match of uh, aqueous phases. You can have some, in some rare instances, we'll actually have some people do normal phase chromatography or chiral chromat chromatography with also a reverse phase column in here as well. And then we'll do washing and switching between the two. So if you ever wanna do stuff like that, by all means, get in touch with me and I can help you work through some of those. So next we're going to go with uh, the automation and the delay. So within the instrument, we actually have a device that changes sample loops so that we can actually go from 4.6 millimeter columns running at two mils a minute with a four component test mix. We can run it at 10, uh, on a 10 millimeter column at five mils a minute, and then it will switch the valve position so that we can have an automatic delay that our peaks will overlap with one another. And we can go up to a third valve, which will actually allow us to do 20 in the ballpark of 20 to 50. And then once we get up to 50, then we'll go ahead and jump to a much higher uh, loop size. So that no matter what, we can always uh, co coincide your UV peaks as well as your ELSD peaks or your mass spec peaks. So we do have a mass spec detector that we like to use for uh, customers. So the previous slides you were seeing, that was ELSD detection. 
So we can also do mass spec detection. So as you can see, we have two different types of mass spec models, one that can go up to 2000 uh, AMU. Typically, most people, though, will stick with the 1200 AMU uh, for the small molecules that people are working on. Uh, we can do ESI or APCI. So it allows us to actually get different types of chemistries onto the mass spec and then feed the information directly into the AccuPrep for doing collection and um, identification of your compounds. And we can also see the mass spec in real time, which can be beneficial to people who want to actually take a look at their compounds. Um, we can actually just insert a little bit of material and actually see what the identification is with method development before we ever even actually run the instrument. So if you take a very dilute uh, portion of your uh, sample, we can actually take and make sure that it is the actual final product. So there's another thing that I've started to come across a lot lately is we have actually have uh, optimization of UV settings to maximize your recovery. Uh, we have had some people consider their samples not good chromophores and so they won't really know exactly what chromophore to look for um, but one of the nice things is with our system we can actually do scouting runs with a very small amount of material and then as you see the peaks come off um, i'm going to put a dot on here so you can actually see right down here that we can actually see the full uv spectrum and that's built into all of our acupreps that you can actually identify where your maximum peak would be um, so we can get the full UV vis uh, if you have a UV vis detector. Typically, most of our customers will only do uh, up to about 300, 350 nanometers, but we do have detectors that go uh, much higher than that and do the full visible spectrum. We can also see this data after the run or during the run, so there's no preferential between either, either way. And we can also minimize the amount of solvent effect that you might get as well. So if we see that you have a stronger chromophore for your compound, up around 250 or 260 or possibly even 280, but your solvent that you're using may have some impurities in it that are giving some issues down around 210 or 220, it'll help you to determine whether or not that would be a better wavelength for you to do your maximum recoveries. We've also been running into some customers who Two wavelengths is usually pretty good and sufficient for most people. Um, a lot of people will just use one wavelength. What we've come across lately is there's some compounds and some chemistries that people are doing where they're having multiple compounds. So what they'll do is they'll actually take this all wavelength detection. And instead of just doing an all wavelength detection where we can actually see the entire wavelength and sort of give an overall average of different wavelengths, we can actually optimize this so that we have wavelength one, wavelength two, and then you can come over here and actually have a third wavelength where we just narrow this uh, region. So in this case, we would be sort of focusing around the 280 nanometer mark. This will allow us to focus on compounds that either do or do not have certain chromophores. So if you know that your compound may have a specific chromophore, but you have two other compounds that don't, we can discriminate that way or um, go the other way. And if your compound doesn't have it, then you can actually pick your peak out uh, and discriminate that from other individual components. Next, we're going to get into some column and mobile phase combinations. Um, there's normal phase and there's reverse phase. Typically, people that I work with are usually doing reverse phase. Uh, they're doing C18, maybe some C8, uh, and occasionally we'll get an AQ column, and I'll get into that in a second. But you can use the normal phase on the AccuPrep system. Most of the people that do normal phase, they're going to get the flash systems, the next gens, um, maybe an easy prep or something like that if they want to go back and forth. But we can actually run normal phase columns on the AccuPrep as well. But these are usually for uh, compounds that you just want to use a simple silica column and you're going to use more of a, a organic solvent phases as opposed to your aqueous phase. So if you have polar compounds, um, typically they're not going to work really well in normal phase. So you're going to want to try and use those in reverse phase. Uh, and with the reverse phase, we can have different selectivity, uh, different porosity, and different carbon loading available on those individual columns. Uh, ironically, last week, um, mo most people use what's in the lab. And this is what we actually ran into last week. We had a customer who brought us a, co a column that's, I think, 15 to 20 years old. And the information on it said that it was about a 10 
10% carbon load. And then the column that we were using that we brought with us to, to work and do the demo was more of an, about a 16 to 18% carbon load. And just the differences between the amount of carbon loading on the column was actually enough to change our peak elution times uh, by about 10 to 15% organic on column. So it's very imperative that if you ever try and compare run to run or injection to injection, that you make sure that you're using the same column phase and same column structure and same solvents. Because we're going to get into some stuff later on that that becomes very important. So one of the things about polar compounds is if you're running very high aqueous content, the aqueous content on most uh, C18 silica columns will try to collapse that phase and you don't get a whole lot of interaction. And you can see that over here on the right hand side. You'll see that there's um, sort of a, what we call a phase collapse where the, the molecules the, of the silica, the C18 change, will actually fall down on themselves and they're not doing a whole lot of work. So what we typically will tell people to do is try this over here, which is your, uh, your AQ column. And what it does is it puts a little uh, blocking group onto the silica that sort of helps keep the stationary phase vertical. And it allows you to have a little bit more interaction with your um, compounds as they go through, especially for your polar compounds. Uh, and so, you know, you can go from mobile phase conditions with methanol, acetonitrile, or THF on any of these columns. It's not really a big deal. We don't focus too much on that. But what I do like to tell people is that in that particular order, methanol, acetonitrile, and THF are typically uh, one of the more effective ways to move your compounds around on a column. So if you'll notice right here, 45% methanol is roughly equivalent to about 35% ACN or about 25% THF. Um, this will allow you to use less organic or more organic, depending upon what your particular objective is. Um, and again, column choices. Uh, you can go phenyl or amino if you want to go to more polar compounds. So the stationary phase, I'm going to just uh, leave these up here. Whoops, did not want to do that. So what we're going to do is you can see here that we have a stationary phase uh, chart, if you will, and then the ability to use the common, uh, compounds based on the actual stationary phase either decreasing or increasing in your hydrophobicity. And this is just a general rule of thumb. Uh, again, there's always uh, rules and, and uh, outliers in just about everything. But this is a general rule of thumb that we like to use. What are about the effects of pH on compounds? Um, one of the biggest things is you just want to make sure that you're either protonating or deprotonating, depending upon what you're actually trying to do. So in this particular instance, um, with a slide from one of my colleagues, actually this came from Chrome Academy, but um, from a co uh, colleague's slides set, is what we can see here is there's two compounds right here. And depending upon where we are in the pKa range, at a higher uh, pH, you're going to be uh, extremely polar and unretained. So at the high pH, it's going to just pretty much fly right through your column. If you have a low pH, it's going to stick and come out here really far back into the back end. If you're somewhere in the middle, we get a mixed mode like this. Well, why is it doing that? Because we have multiple compounds in there that will both, one may protonate, one may not protonate, and we are sort of in a, a two-state phase where it will not actually be one or the other. And this is the worst possible scenario. So typically what we like to do is make sure that your pH and your pK is, is above or below your pKa of all the, um, constituents of your actual compound. Solvent modifiers can improve peak shape. Um, TFA is typically the most common one, but some people will try and use uh, other things for say mass spec. So if you're using mass spec, maybe you're gonna use uh, acetic acid or formic acid, just so that you don't have to reduce your ionization settings. Um, some people will actually go the other way and actually use base modifiers. So maybe uh, triethylamine or some other stronger bases, depending upon what your uh, pKa is of your compound. Um, we typically don't like customers to use uh, acid and base mobile phases or, or vice versa. Um, 
you can potentially strip off the stationary phase. So we like to make sure that you are using com columns that are matched to the actual mobile phase conditions you're looking for. So there are columns out there that have high pH ranges that can go from very low to very high, but they typically have a very high carbon load base and are much more stable. Um, we just don't want you damaging and ruining your columns. So sample loading conditions and considerations. So we have a couple different methods for doing this. So in our world, all of our preparative chromatography is being manual inject or uh, liquid injection. So we can do a manual injection, an auto injector. We have an auto sampler. Um, and we also have a sample loading pump. Uh, what you put the sample in is going to be critically important on how your chromatography works and how much loading you can get out of it. And I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, and most importantly, filter your samples. Without protections to uh, your sampling techniques, you can damage hardware, you can damage your columns. Um, and in the worst case, obviously, you're not getting your compounds back. So we'll try and walk through that and give you some ideas for how to make sure you don't do that. So we have a manual injector, an auto injector, uh, a sample loading pump, and an auto sampler. And I'll go through a little bit of each one of those. Before we get into the loading too far, this is one of those pages that I mentioned that I'm going to go ahead and leave up for a second or two for you to look at. This is what we typically like to go off of when we look at a column and trying to figure out what our optimal loading, our conditions are. Um, for the flow rate and for the run times, we actually build this information directly into our software when we program in the column that you're using. So we can actually take these optimal flow rates and actually put them into your default methods right off the bat. So these are the different manual injection options that you have. So you have a lure adapter port. So if you want to do a manual injection, you can just basically screw that right on into the valve. The first one up here, that you screw it into the valve and you can just go ahead and use a uh, lure lock syringe and load as much sample as you want. This is a similar device right here, um, except for it's stainless steel. Uh, I like to give the people the, the option of both. Uh, obviously certain compounds are a little bit more sensitive than others. This is also another option that I don't particularly try to use too much, but you may see these floating around in some of our systems. It's called a blunt tip needle syringe port. And so what it is, is it basically screws in and then uses, you use a standard 22 gauge needle, uh, kind of like an analytical size needle to go ahead and inject your samples for very small amounts of material. The problem we see with this is there has been some issues where people will put in a GC 22 gauge needle that has a very sharp tip to it and an angled tip. And it can actually damage the rotor seals and the hardware inside of the injection valve. And then it doesn't hold seal anymore. So we try and steer clear those uh, when we're doing manual injections. And here are our auto sampler and auto injector options. Um, traditionally, I do not like to use the auto injector, but it does actually have some very good uses in certain circumstances. The auto injector is basically just a repetitive injection device that creates reproducible injections down to 10 microliters, but you can only use one sample at a time and it's one injection for an entire series. Uh, the best places that I've seen this used for is if you're doing large scale purifications and you're doing maybe 20 injections of a mill or two, and you just keep repeating that same exact material out of a beaker. What I prefer is the actual auto sampler, and we can do different samples out of different tubes. We actually get an additional set of racks as well. So you can see right down here, we have some fraction racks here that you can actually add to it. So we get twice as many fraction racks. Um, and we also have a scouting pause feature so that when we're done with a run, we can actually go ahead and transition to an actual uh, large scale injection after a small injection. And it's completely automatically washes everything. So let's go to this. So sample option or solvent options for an auto sampler. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this one because I've actually done an entire series on this in the past, but this comes up quite frequently for customers. What I'm just gonna let you know out of the next couple slides that's very critical is I prefer DMSO to do my injections or DMF or DMA. Uh, I actually ran into a customer this past week that's doing DCB, uh, dichlorobenzene, and they all work very similar. Uh, they're very high solubility uh, so you can load lots of material in a very small injection size. 
the problem with methanol is it's not quite as soluble, but even with the same amount of solubility, um, you still wind up having some solvent effects that cause your peaks to become distorted. Of course, the perfect scenario is if you can just put your sample in water and inject it on the, the system, but that's not usually uh, very effective or, or uh, usually a common occurrence. So we have to look at other options. And so that's where we're going to go to next. And so you can see here right now, we have a 100 microliter injection of uh, amino hydroxy, hydroxybenzoate, relatively polar compound. And as you can see, it's a very shallow gradient. So this is obviously a, a very uh, accentuated effect for uh, demonstration purposes. But as you can see, all three injections look relatively normal. The difficulty was with the water, we actually had some uh, impurities build up. Uh, from the actual heating of the water to try and get the sample into solution. But everything else looked fine. So as soon as we do go to 200 microliter injection, all of a sudden we started seeing some distortion with the methanol, not so much with the DMSO. We go to 500 and it's extensive distortion with the methanol. And we actually have some breakthrough as you can see the 254 trace actually sliding all the way through in the void. We're still pretty good with the DMSO though. Nothing's broken through. We do get some peak shape distribution. And so we have here the two mil injection. And as you can see, the chromatography is really bad across the board for both the DMSO and the methanol. And we're losing complete uh, elution of the compound. Um, again, it's worse with methanol, but yet we're still fairly decent here with the water. But again, we have that impurity. So one way that we've been able to fix that is we actually do a sample loading pump. And a sample loading pump, what it does is it allows us to do large amounts of material and actually load them onto the column. Uh, and this was a, a test injection of just one mil loaded onto the column through the pump. And then we tried to do a dilution of nine to one and then put it on in 10 mils. So that is literally the same amount of material on the column. And this is our universal test mix. So this isn't even a polar compound. And it's still causing lots of peak distortion and a lot of problems just because we have that excess amount of methanol in there. Well, how do you fix this? Well, one of the ways that we have come up with fixing this kind of problem is I actually took that same one mil injection and then I diluted it. So as you see here in the beginning of the run, we did a 50-50 dilution with your mobile phase coming from the system. And we were able to load that at the same time that we were loading our injection pump onto the column. And by doing that, we've actually increased our resolution and increased our separation factor and capacity to load a lot more. And that's the same exact 10 mil injection. Next, we're going to get into uh, higher purity. And how can we do that? We have a function that's called a focus gradient generator. So the focus gradient generator allows us to take any size column, uh, any size injection from 10 microliters up to the, the volume of the loop. And we can actually scale up. And this is where I mentioned earlier that it is critical that we actually keep an eye on our stationary phases and make sure that they're the same and that the mobile safe phase and acid compositions are all the same as well. So it allows us to scale up from an analytical column all the way up to maybe a 50 millimeter column. And the linearity is actually pretty good as far as the retention, assuming the columns are uh, the same. When I used to work at Merck, one of the things that we used to do is we had a chart. And if your chart and your compound came out between uh, five and 25% on your analytical column, then you would run, you know, basically this retention time from two to four, we would run that kind of gradient. If it's from four to six, we would run that kind of gradient. So the problem is, what if we were like right on the cusp, which one would you use? So it became very difficult for certain compounds to get a really good isolation. The other thing that a lot of people don't take into account is the delay volumes. So even though this compound right here at 3.24 looks like it might be coming off the column, say about 25 or 30 percent, it's actually in reality because of delay volumes actually only coming off at about 10 to maybe 15 percent. So we need to take that into account whenever we do these kinds of calculations. Well, we have a way around that. Our software actually allows you to do that. We would basically pick the column that you want to run. We'll run a very steep gradient and then wash everything off. And that's done simply by programming the software and saying, I want to run a scout run. So when you run the scout run, and this is our internal scout, you can basically run a gradient, as you can see here in the background, pick your 
focus button and we would choose the peak of interest. So we would take this very steep gradient and what it'll do is it'll turn into this shallow gradient. So we can actually isolate your compounds. And as you can see, we go from that, from that. So we had a very short resolution between the two compounds. And now we have truckloads of separation and we can actually uh, load this up way more than you would have with the standard uh, five to 95 type gradient. Here's some examples of this. So someone actually took four components and notice how we have tight resolution and there's no separation between any of these back peaks. Then they said, I wanna focus on this peak at 12.87, came off at about 63% and you can see the shallow gradient, but we got all four compounds well isolated and well resolved. Um, and it works on any type of stationary phase, whether it's silica, C18, uh, you can use chiral media. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, it's scalable from uh, micro LC all the way up to uh, grams of a material. Here's a real life example um, from a customer of mine in uh, Canada. They actually gave me the sample when we were doing a demo. Um, I had no idea what the sample was, had no idea what to do with it. Um, I saw all these compounds up here. So I'm like, yeah, it's not quite pure. Let's, let's, you know, focus it. Let's see what we can come up with. And then I wound up running it and we got this kind of separation back here. And this peak actually became two different components as we started to scale it up. Turns out that we went from a one milligram scout to a 30 milligram purification and I actually got 30% of their material. So we were looking at like nine milligrams of this and 21 milligrams of their main product. This was actually cleared. It was a contract lab. Their analytical group had actually uh, allowed this to go move forward to actually being shipped. Uh, the end user actually noticed after the fact, he told me he ran it on NMR and he saw a 30% impurity and he didn't know where it was. So after this, we were able to actually isolate that 30% impurity for them and save them uh, a lot of headaches uh, with a very impure product. Um, we can also expedite these uh, methods from analytical to preparative runs. And this is what we call our external. So as you saw just a couple minutes ago, we did a simpler internal side where it's all in one system. You can use prep and analytical columns. Uh, it's, it's good for demonstrating the instrument capabilities uh, and there's very little room for failure. However, um, what we've come up with is the next step of this. So what we can do is we can take values off of your analytical UHPLC, um, doesn't matter whose, as long as we're using the same stationary phase and same mobile phases, um, we can do analytical size scales, even if you want to do, you know, this two micron columns. Great. We can go do a really small column it's going to be hard to scale them up to five micron but at least you know you can do a two millimeter column scale up to a large column um, based on what we run here and then we can put the information directly over into the acuprep this allows the acuprep to run more purifications it's quite simple once we set it up and you'll see here in a second how easy it is uh, and it allows you to keep your existing workflows so you just basically run your analytical like you normally would take that value and then drop it right on into your preparative system. So we would have to enable our external calibration. And just with these values right here, we would able to be uh, ready to go with doing a, a purification on an analysis, analytical uh, analysis. So here we have a peak that's at 2.29. We ran our analytical. We put all of these values into uh, that page that I just showed you. Um, we took the 2.2 and just sort of rounded it. And then we did this separation and said, okay, if you're going to put in 2.2, I'm going to use this gradient based on the calculations. And we were able to isolate this thymosin right out of the center of this, this massive other material. And it gives us a, a much better purity and a lot, a lot more loadability for your compounds. So now I'm going to get into a couple of troubleshooting uh, techniques um, for quicker results. One of the things that I've come across uh, that is typically a problem for customers is extreme peak splitting. You could possibly have a column damage issue, uh, especially if you're running uh, a column that's not stable in high pH. Uh, mentioned, I mentioned earlier that you could actually shear off some of your phase. 
that could possibly create one of those voids. Uh, I have seen customers use excessive amounts of DMSO or put palladium uh, when they're running the large sampling with DMSO. So that's kind of one of the things where I try and tell people to make sure that you filter your samples again. Uh, and there are materials out there that you can actually take metals and pull metals out of your sample solution. And that will help you to prevent some of these kinds of column damages. We can lose uh, the bonded phase from hydrolysis uh, at low pH as well. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you need to be careful of and not to damage your columns. Usually putting the columns into a neutral state after you're done with them, or if you're going to let them sit for very long, um, as you see here, wash your modifiers from the columns uh, before storing overnight. I don't necessarily always do that, but it's definitely the best practice. So if I know I'm going to be running again tomorrow, I'll go ahead and just leave it and maybe dilute 0.1% TFA or uh, acetic acid. And usually it's sufficient to um, keep it stable overnight. Uh, but if you are going to extend your columns out for an extended period of time, uh, try not to, to let them sit in an acid or a base too much. Um, and what about sample loading? We kind of got into this a little bit earlier, but we have a tendency to have customers who will try and load five mils of sample onto a five mil loop. And it tends to not work out so well uh, because of laminar issues. We're better than other instruments. Um, both our auto sampler and our manual injection are usually pretty accurate. But as you can see here, um, we do have a little bit of a linearity, linearity drop off. Um, as we start to increase the amount of material. So here, this blue peak uh, and the red peak are both on the five mil loop. As we go to a five mil injection, we're losing a little bit of five uh, of that five mils off the back end of the loop. Um, if you go to the Readine website, what they'll tell you is that at 100% uh, of the injection volume of the loop, Traditionally, most people will see up to about a 50% loss of their material. So anywhere from um, 25 to 50% uh, loss of their material and it'll come off the back end. So with that, we can increase loading capacity. Um, again, go with a stronger solvent like DMSO as opposed to a weaker solvent. Um, loading a lot of water is definitely going to be a problem, but it stays in solution, but it also will come through the, the loop quicker. And uh, because recovery is, is everything that we're looking for. Uh, I typically will tell people to load uh, no more than 50% of their loop, but we can go a little bit higher. Um, I just don't like being the one that caused somebody to lose their compound. Um, and only with our auto sampler module uh, can we actually get these kind of accuracies. If you're doing manual injection, it's, it's a little bit harder. Um, to get the accurate uh, reproducible injections. And we also have, oh, so these are some of the extra things I forgot to mention. With the auto sampler, we actually will um, have an air sample or an air gap to prevent some of that mixing so that we don't actually get a lot of the band broadening and laminar flow issues. Uh, the other thing that we can also do is with our auto sampler, we have a bracketing solvent. So if you are using DMSO, what we'll do is we'll take up a little bit of like a, a bubble of DMSO before and after your compound. So that as we load it onto the column, it doesn't actually crash out and cause any problems. So we discussed principles behind HPLC. Um, we had some of the approaches that I like to take for method development and for resolution. Um, some of the different loading techniques that are available to you. Uh, choosing the, the best loading solvents, I think it's critical in, in my opinion to making sure that you have uh, successful separations and some loading parameters. So with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Uh, you can have many different ways. Sharon uh, will uh, field the questions now for us. So you can either um, raise your hand, I think, or type in uh, your questions and then I'll go ahead and field them as they come in. Hopefully you enjoyed today's uh, webinar. And if you have, by all means, email us, get in touch with us um, and uh, share the content once it comes up on to uh, Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever you guys happen to see it. Uh, and uh, looking forward to working with you all in the future. Uh, with that,
again, Todd Anderson, Global Chromatography Specialist. Tell it, let's go. That's my direct number. Um, and of course, my email. So I'm going to leave this up here for you while we take some questions. And I'm going to turn it back over to Sharon. Thank you so much, Sharon, for being with us today and helping me uh, get through this.